Welcome to Answers from the Universe and the Andronicus Transmissions on Wolf Spirit Radio, Ever Beyond Radio, and Studio 9 Jam on YouTube. With your host, Jessica Ariel Morocco, featuring JP as the voice of Andronicus. Please visit www.readingsbyrael.com. That's A R A E L. We came from the future by way of the past. I bought my ticket for the 15th century. We started moving through a hole in history. Listening to Wolf Spirit Radio. Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today at the Answers from the Universe and the Andronicus Transmissions. I'm here with JP, my co-host, and um, I just, you know, there's some incredible things that are coming through. More information, um, and I apologize for not having the show last week. I really felt uh, compelled to um, hold off. It felt like it was a transitional phase and allow things to just settle a bit before we moved on to the next transmission. So um, besides that, I wasn't feeling well, but really um, I had ample time to put together the transmissions. So um, maybe one point or another, we just needed that break recollect our thoughts, and then go in and start to listen because it's going to get pretty heavy again today. So um, hold on to your seats. <laughs> has a lot of information. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to bring in um, Captain Max Steele and Nicole. Are you guys there? I'm here, but Nicole, uh, she said she'll listen. She's listening. Okay. And, uh, JP, of course, is here with us. And, uh, well, we have, uh, was your dog baby <laughs> in the background? Baby, be um, quiet. Come here. <laughs> so what I want to say thank you, Maxie. You, um, thank you for supporting my work and, and, um, donating a beautiful laptop to me for helping me to continue with my work. And, um, it's coming from the heart. You're a beautiful person. You and Nicole, um, have been very kind and I appreciate your friendship. And uh, thanks for having me as a co-host last night with Andrew Basaggio last night as well. So um, it's it's just been wonderful. Thank you so very much. Well, it's it's my pleasure to to be here for you because uh, I know that uh, the, the system you have for for your show is not really good enough. So uh, Nicole and myself, we decided to buy you a brand new. Dell laptop with everything on it and with three year warranty. And, um, I just sent you the link. It's, it's on your, it's on its way and it'll be there. It'll be there tomorrow. So enjoy the computer and uh, I'm always here to help you and anything that you ask. Uh, and, um, me and Nicole, we love you very much. And, uh, if we can always help someone out there, we will do it. So, uh, I'm going to, re- um, I'm going to let you Go on with the show, and uh, thank you for being my friend, Jessica and JP. Thank you, Max. Okay, I'm going to hang up now to listen to your show. <laughs> okay, and uh, JP, I also want to thank you as well for um, providing a headset because of some of the technical challenges we've had, and and uh, from the bottom of my heart, you know I love all of you guys. You've been really wonderful. And thank you for uh, supporting and being um, just authentic and and good friends, just wonderful people. Um, you, you are so insightful, and but there's just the beauty about all of you, and I truly appreciate everything. We, we do it because we love you. Thank you, thank bye you, bye. And, and the love is returned back. <laughs> bye. Yeah, bye. Have a good show. We'll be listening. Bye. Bye, Max. Thank you. Okay, right. Now, um, I'm going to need to uh, adjust my microphone so that I'm not louder than everybody else. So there's sort of been a volume issue. So I'm, 
Uh, as I said, I've just installed this new mixing desk, and uh, it's I haven't quite got the the tweezing correct. So that should be a comfortable level. Uh, now that's kind of that's peaking a little bit. Um, Jessica, can you give me a count of five just for a second? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Well, I'm still a little bit loud, so let me just take that down a bit. Okay, well, we'll see, we'll see how everybody hears. So, bless you. Oh, look at you. I'll in the um, chat room. Uh, yes, I hope it's all, uh, it's all sounding good. And, um, for those of you who are listening in stereo on headphones, you may hear that I'm slightly to the left and Jessica's slightly to the right. Just to exploit our, uh, our, uh, <laughs> stereo broadcast, you know, rather than having everybody right in the middle. You know, what's the point of having stereo if you're right in the middle? Uh, anyway, so today, um, well, actually, earlier this morning, we uh, we were uh, uh, interviewing Andrew Basiago, uh, and he's mm-hmm. um, he's likely to be running for president in 2020 as well as this year, isn't he? So uh, that was quite an yeah, exciting. Yeah, and I, it's unfortunate that he didn't get. Um, enough airtime for people to actually see where he's coming from. He's his uh clarity of thinking and his processing of how to help the how to help um the nation and to um really come out and bring in an honesty about what's actually going on on the planet regarding, you know, some of the E T information that people have been that we've been traveling to Mars. Um, through the military, some of the higher technology that we have. Uh, you know, a lot of this stuff, I don't think it, it, um, puts us in any danger. I think it's the right of the, the general public to know, you know, especially if it's one of our planes or a UFO and if they're a friendly UFO, if they're a not so friendly UFO, I think it's only fair that people know. Instead of just something happening and then creating this mass hysteria. So, I mean, I think, you know, when we get to the point as a, as we're in a universal consciousness that we're willing to look at the truth and accept it and be open to what the reality of that is, then we will exercise more freedoms, more knowledge and take on more responsibility. And, um, I, I think that his information was highly helpful and and listen to Max Steele's show from last night, which is um I'm just looking at, at the date. It would have been May fourth, uh Wednesday night, May fourth, um, with his uh Max's interview. And um I encourage everyone to listen to that and really look at, at uh Andrew as as a candidate even now. Anything else you want to say, JP? Uh, well, I mean, it was, uh, it was a pleasure to speak to him, uh, again after so many years. Um, as, as I said, I've, uh, I spoke to him several years ago, uh, uh through, uh, our mutual friend William Stillings. And so, I mean, it, it was really nice. And also, uh, I gave him a quick ray reading, of course. And, uh, his rays are one, two, one, which means, you know, he's a, that's a presidential ray system, uh, presidential ray mm-hmm. package, a first ray personality. Is this is that um, it's like somebody whose mind is at the top of the mountain. You know, it's just they mm-hmm. just got some insight. So, shall we? What about the information uh, they, that he brought in about Akhenaten and um, Obama? Well, wasn't that interesting? Obama had... Wasn't that yeah. interesting? And the whole Martian mm-hmm. thing. So, do, do, you, do you want to lay out what 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 he was saying? What or rather, what well, you heard him saying? He was he was with. Um, Obama, yeah, although he called him, um, oh, what was the other name? That he was, he, he Barry. Was, okay, uh, let, let me just say that, um, uh, Stillings, who I've spoken to over many years, um, you know, we, we're quite good friends now, um, has given us exactly the same information. So they're, they're completely corroborating each other. Um, and, uh, Andrew says it from his point of view, from his perspective. And that's really interesting because, you know, the way, he, you hear the, the two stories spoken from individual perspectives. It's not like they're sharing a narrative. They're both saying things from the same. Anyway, yeah, he knew him as Barry Sotero, uh, and his mother was Stanley Dunham. But 
all of these could have been um, placement because they all work for the CIA. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. And so, and, and of course, he got it got into the, the the space program, and here he is going back and forth to Mars, and he sees himself as a president in the future, um, as well as Andrew did. But interesting enough, Andrew did not get into office yet, um, but um, Barry or Obama did. But some of the things that uh, we brought brought up, he said um, that Mars actually has had um, somehow uh, collided with the Earth. And so that's where you see Sedona. It's essentially the same terrain. And so then we started getting into that whole thing about how, you know, what the terrain is like. And then he also talked about uh, remnants of uh, Egyptian like um, um, uh, Kardush. Or, or something of that nature. Cartouche. And the cartouche, cartouche is the um, the oval. You know when you when you have the hieroglyphic things. Emblem. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. there's a kind of oval thing. It's like a long, elongated oval. Uh, it's like what, what we see like Facebook buttons these days. That's what a cartouche is. It's it's and it's got a, it's a labeled button, uh, if you like, that um, has mm-hmm. a particular form. A particular shape, and it's usually got somebody's name right. on it. Yeah, it's like an emblem right. of somebody. So, yes, the cartouches. Uh, the, so then the, he started bringing up the whole Egyptian connection to Mars. Exactly, right? exactly, and how Egypt, uh, Egyptian Empire, um, extended <laughs> to Mars, or could it be that the Martian Empire extended to Egypt? That was the question that I was asking well, in my mind. Absolutely. Well, we we always got the impression that it, they came from Sirius, but they could have done both. I mean, they could have stayed in Mars um, simultaneously as they were here. We don't really have a timeline. Um, but what I thought was interesting is, is he started to bring up um, Akhenaten. And I said, well, isn't it interesting that um, Obama has a, a strong resemblance of Akhenaten? And then he went on further to say, well, there's some talk that that he was actually um somehow this the uh, dna of akhenaten was um as a result of obama's birth and um yep. and he then said that akhenaten was the sun god i said well he called himself the sun god but according to the andronicus information akhenaten was not the sun god akhenaten was aten or athena so this is, I didn't bring this up to him. I figured that would just throw everything off into but, a tailspin. But the thing is, renegade. Renegade. Ath- so Athena uh, is a Obama renegade. Has it. And that's yes, Obama's well, code name. Yeah. Yeah. Athena was a male that wanted to seduce an ET who came down who was Zeus or Andronicus. And uh, then got these uh, extra abilities as a result of having this physical interaction. Now, ETs are, you know, their gender is not similar to us all the time. So, um, you know, for whatever reason that 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 occurred, and uh, and then you have this this cutting off where um, uh, Athena, you know, wanted more power than she was supposed to have, and of course Zeus or Androticus leaves because. He never stays anywhere for any length of time once he's finished doing what he wants to do and then he leaves. So whoever is in power there kind of rises like the the Hera that we talked about earlier and Athena. So the whole thing is just really very strange. Now you have the DNA of Akhenaten, who is Athena, and um, here he is uh, running the nation, which is not surprising. Um because that essentially was the uh, protocol or, or the behavior. You look for the personality and behaviors of uh, these beings from ancient times. It's going to be the same. The personalities will somewhat be the same. Their desire for power will be the same. And she was somewhat popular. So you're seeing that also. Obama's somewhat popular. So um, anyhow. Um, so is there anything else, JP, that you... Wanted to bring up. <coughs> well, me. that was, uh, hang on a second. Oh dear. Hang on a second. Ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Hang on. I just, I uh, need to remedy what I've just done. Um, okay. uh, by deleting that. Okay. There we go. And I can delete that as well. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, 
Yeah. We're right. going to be starting with Andronicus's transmission. Um, it, 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 like for those that are listening, and, and even if this is the first time you listen to the show, um, each one of them, I'm talking to them in their real time. Whatever is going on at that present time is where they're at. Um, it doesn't mean that they're in our timetable right now, but um, somewhere in time we connect, and this is where they're at at that time, and they're explaining their experience. Uh, and another thing, so in, Jess, mm-hmm. is that somehow there is a linearity created in our, well, from our perspective, from, you know, the perspective of the Andronicus transmissions, <laughs> there does seem to be some kind of progression, some kind of evolution. They seem to be going through learning phases. There does seem to be that linear progression that this, this story is telling, although the yes. uh, timing and positioning of each each connection can be all over the place because they time travel. So we're speaking to them from their own internal perspective time frame. Am I making sense? Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Hmm. Yes. So they could, they could be in the future. They could be anywhere they want, hmm. but that's where I'm meeting them. And so that's why it's like, well, are they around you right now? Um, no, it's like I'm peering through a window and this is what they're describing and this is what I'm seeing when I'm communicating with them at that moment. And then they usually, what I'm finding is they, when they're finished saying what they need to say, then it stops. So it's it's like a psychic Skype. Is it like Skype with Hmm. video or more? Do you see more? Can you feel, smell? Are there more senses in there? Um, probably more of a video. (coughs) I hear their voices. And um, I can feel their emotions and what they're going through. But uh, mm-hmm. not so much scent, but maybe there has been one or two times that I smelled something. Interesting. So it's you. It's a kind of empath. Em, I'm, I'm going to have to come up with a word. Empathic Skype. Empathic psychic sp- <laughs> <laughs> You can't even say it. But anyway, that sort of, yeah. that sort of communication. And like, uh, you know, um, is, is there a, hey, Jess, I'm going to call you now kind of thing? Yeah, I get a feeling. I get a feeling. And sometimes I just, they just start talking. I'm like, oh, hi. You know, <laughs> what what's going on now? And uh, then, you know, there are times when I'm like, I'm not anywhere where I can write. Because then, you know, the information comes through and, and I can't retain it, but I get snippets of it. And then I'll go back in and, and then it takes a slightly different turn. But that's because time had lapsed. But so yeah, it's, it's unexpected at times when they want, want to speak, they just come through. So. Let's start off with our traditional introduction. You didn't hear that. Did you hear that? Yeah, I did. You did. All right. I didn't. All right. Yes. Yeah. So we're doing Andronicus 44, right? Oh, yeah. I can hear it now. Sorry, it wasn't coming out of my headphones. Again, settings on new mixer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. All right. Anyway, meanwhile, <clears throat> Andronicus 44. Do you remember me? You don't remember me very much, do you? I guess it has been a very long time. I'm just sitting here on a beautiful cliff on an unnamed mountain in Japan. I love this place, the landscape, the simple trees and colour of the land contrasted by the ocean. It is lovely. I wish you could see it from here. I know you can only see me in a soft silhouette. I intended it to be that way. You know, while I was sitting here, I beheld all the tragic things that were to befall Japan in the future. Tsunamis, nuclear war, and other nuclear accidents. 
the people suffer so much that I could only weep for them. No one loves these people as I do. They are gentle, specific, cunning in the arts of all types. They are perfectionists and innovators of a rare kind. They see details like no other people. Many of their charming ways are overlooked by many, because no one would have to think like them to see what detailed thought goes into much of what they do. Their food, for example, requires much devotion towards the appearance as well as texture and flavor. I often wondered if they embraced the art of something more than savoring the goodness of flavor or scent. I've placed bubble after bubble of div divine protection over this land, only to be gone for a while and return to see that there is nothing left to protect them. It is the oddest thing to observe. I questioned if someone was undoing my work. I have viewed it from all perspectives and found nothing. The people's sharp energy seemed to pierce and subtly remove the remnants of the bubble. All of the problems occur when I am off working elsewhere and cannot return on time. No other people need such protection outside of what you refer to as the Middle East. Too much occurs there that prevents intervention. It is a constant drain of energy that flows consistently and tirelessly. I had a discussion with the elders, and they would like to preserve some of the old cultures from many of the island people. They have a charm and a harmony like none other. They sing with nature. It is truly lovely. I have four beautiful women at my request, and I don't want any of them. I prefer to spend my time with the elders to get to talk about their wishes. The women seem petty, frivolous, and without real purpose. I have deeper insights from the children. Unfortunately, I have to inform the elders that this will be my last visit to Japan. I have no other purpose to return. I have asked them to protect their souls from the dark energies still residing in the land. Don't be persuaded by their influences. They are not deities, but rather dark entities. I'm not positive that they will listen. They're begging me to stay. They don't understand my duties are for all, not just one culture or even one species. I'll watch the sunset tonight and depart before dawn. They will mourn me in the morning as if I have died. I shall send them one last gift. It is a gift of prosperity through ingenuity. They can always be ahead. One last warning. Do not combine the human soul with the machine. This is when your race will face their destiny. I don't think they will listen in the end, but I am hopeful. Andronicus. I didn't speak to Andronicus, only listened to him. I could see that it was best to just hear what he had to say. And his heart was very, very heavy and sorrowful. Yeah, I could feel that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Saying goodbye. I think he was worried that yeah. their, their technology, they were going to try to create uh, technology with human souls and, and robots. Um, and had warned them about that years ago, I guess. Wow. So I don't, mm. yeah, and he, he, he loved, loved the people. It was interesting as, as, um, I had a Japanese girlfriend for a wee while and, uh, it was the, the gentle, specific cunning in the arts of all types. Yeah. They're perfectionists and yeah. innovators of a rare kind. They see details like no people. Many of their charming ways are overlooked by many because no one would have to think like them to see what detailed thought goes into much of what they do. I mean, when I was reading that, I, I was picturing, uh, picturing this woman and, uh, the way she would work. And also, you know, sushi. 
<laughs> right. Wolf Baby makes sushi too. It's very interesting. Hmm. She makes sushi it brilliantly. Is, they're, 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 Virgo. They're they're artists. They're um, beautiful. And um, you know, I was watching the movie about the uh, the Last Samurai, and how from a you know a Caucasian American perspective, observing how they they live their daily life and how meticulous they were with their hair and everything that they did. And then here's uh, Andronicus bringing it up. But I think he saw himself as a part of that culture and um, embraced a lot of the, um, the, the Far East. He um, also, you know, had a strong affinity for Tibet and um, resided in Shangri-La with, with some of the very, very high masters on the planet. And uh, so, and very likely, t- you know, taught them, gave them insight and information. Well, they would hang out. So cause the they last- would, yeah, they would hang out with the, uh, with the other masters who would visit them. And they'd just sit and hang out like we do, you know, like round tables. Yeah. And he could communicate with them. They were, because they raised their consciousness, there was something to talk about. <coughs> and the other part is, um, he also helped, you know, he called them the island people. He liked the way that they were. They're surrounded by water, sunshine. Um, there was just a grace about, you know, I think he's talking even about the whole Polynesian culture as well. Yeah, and I other, see that. other islands. I see the flowers mm-hmm. around the hair and the just lovely movements and swaying and all that. Yeah, and just, you know, eating healthy and nothing's artificial and uh, kind of the community living, which Andronicus seems to be highly attracted to. He likes that, you know, let's, let's sit around, let's share, share our food, let's have a fire, let's have music and uh, let's, let's have discussions. And so, uh, that's, that's Andronicus, and he essentially has been the same from the very beginning where we see him with um, the other Andromedans, and he does this from place to place, and that's usually when he's most happy. So he finds civilizations and cultures that emulate that and um, could potentially appear in a civilization like that. But um, discreetly, you know, maybe he just shows up as a stranger. Yeah, um, or, or another, uh, another, yeah, sorry. Another, another way, if, a, a way to look at Andronicus is that whole uh, series of Kung Fu, where he uh, travels and just kind of, kind of helps people along the way. That's very Andronicus-like. Yeah, very much. And that's what I was going to say, is that he would appear in Japanese history as someone like that teacher, you know. Mm-hmm. Exactly like the, the master who taught David Carradine, who may even be an incarnation. You know, you never know who's an incarnation of what these days. Right. You don't. And, and that, that is coming up. And I had, um, some very strange things come up. This it completely threw me off. Of all of the, the transmissions, that one threw me off the most. But, um, we're going to read that one last. Um, no music today because it's very sobering what he has to say and and so um uh I think we'll go with that last. Yeah, don't want to have an uh, and finally then, nice fluffy one. <laughs> usually meet yeah, us. Uh, well, usually usually meet us is the and finally fluffy. Fun. One, yeah. Wasn't yeah, usually. So, uh who do you want next? Well, well maybe we should go with um how about this? We do Rodan and then meet us and then Thor. Yeah, good idea. Thor comes through. Yeah, Thor's quite, uh, he's, he's got that, you know, he's a bit lighter. Anyway, yeah. so Rodan. Yeah, <laughs> which one's Rodan? That was... Rodan's a lightning bolt or something, huh? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. oh I had a lightning bolt. Hang on, which, there's, see, I've got a lightning yeah, and I've got a thunder. Which one's lightning? Yeah. Uh. I think it was thunder. Rodan, 21.
Many awake in the middle of the night, wondering what the future will hold. You are in a loop of unending sound and weightless floating through dimensions like gossamer veils of realities, and you wonder why there's so much confusion. The black seems white and the white seems black. Even the grey has a tinge of burning embers. Shall I go on? I wish I could simplify it for you. You're hearing information from all perspectives and yet none satisfy you. Partial truths, maybe. Or could it be that you're just a wandering star, moving but not travelling in distance, experiencing things that are not real but have a point of reality? It appears I am speaking in riddles, but I am not. I cannot boldly proclaim to you what the primary dilemma is, nor may it matter if you knew the truth but couldn't change it for the better. It sounds hopeless, all of it. I'm hearing the collapse of this and the intrusion upon our reality by limbo beings, not typically known to interface with our species. There's darkness from quarters not sentient, not alive as we know it, not born or capable of dying. What type of future does it hold for us? A future is your past and it is your present all of which is happening in the moment, yet you abound out of the parameters, the realm you refer to as the matrix, the fabricated reality derived from a machine, and the prime machine is the source. So, what of it? How many times can you splinter a splinter until it no longer exists, or does its energies forever exist, because it may, as a tree, have life, and all things that have life continue to live beyond their form? You call this an artifact, I call this survival. The more powerful the being, the stronger the light, the longer the life force of that living thing endures. How does one become powerful? Go within. It is the inversion of the soul that holds all the secrets of life. The outside is your visual that we created and you build upon. We discovered this path from within. I won't say how or where I learned this from. The more important part is that this is the most valuable information. Your enlight you enlight your enlightened self is to journey into the depths of what you already know and then surpass it with infinitum. The glass that breaks into the shards of life and illumines the body with revitalization is the first key to unlocking the soul. It takes time to achieve the inner path because it is a long journey of reawakening, but it is worth it. The sun is your source on nutrients, source of nutrients, life and sustenance. It also serves to support all planets of the solar system. Regard it with great reverence. Be mindful of all the living things that were a gift to you. The water that helps you live. The water that helps you live the land that bears fruit, the ocean that provides sea life and other vegetation that feeds you, the air that helps to reseed the plants. All must return to its original form. All must learn to grow and harvest, purify the water, be in harmony with the planet as much as possible. Stop fracking and unnecessary breaking of the Earth's surface. A great violation is occurring to those who perform such acts and their children, children's children, and children's children, children ad infinitum will suffer. It is not lawful to harm the planet that was given to the seed of God. The perpetrators of not of the protected species and are violators within this dimensional plane and reality. You are not one and the same with these invading species. They are here to take from your birthright. We had given them the sphere where they are allowed to exist and have now forfeited the right to return to their homes because of this extended series of violations and with re repeated warnings they have yet to abide with our agreements and laws. Some of you believe that we are not concerned or engaged or mm. some of you believe that we are not concerned or engaged in your experience. That couldn't be farther from the truth. What you are not aware of is that there are many other cousins or related species to your race 
who abide in other regions of the solar system. Some even have taken lawful encampment within the planet. This is to assist you if you are at threat of a major attack upon the Earth. Try not to confuse them with the dark energies who also abide within the great caverns and labyrinth of the earth, or Hades. These beings are not here to assist you. Should I go on about the atrocities? Should I go on about the atrocities? Or should I say that my patience on, the, on these matters are ending? Is. All right, start again. Should I go on about the atrocities, or should I say that my patience on these matters is ending? I must begin a process of taking the offending parties to the outer regions or galactic prisons, as you may interpret. This is the beginning of the exodus off the planet. These species can no longer hide. We have ways of finding them. I am telling you all this so you will understand what is about to take place. I'm also telling you that I'm watching over your experience. It is not my will to have any harm come to innocent parties nor humankind. The information for all humankind is embedding in your soul. It was once also housed within your DNA. The beasts have been hoping to remove all traces of this connection and memory to your ancient lineage. Hard as they may try, they cannot access the soul links to the embedded truths of their existence. Do you think I would leave you alone and without a path? Never. The great quest for you is to remember your role here at this time and at this place. You, you are listening. I am calling you forth to remember. Now is the time for you to use your higher energy to assist the planet. It is not an accident you have been listening. It is time to learn, know, and move through with knowledge and remembrance. I have a role for each and every one of you. Each one of you is important to helping the planet thrive at this time and at this hour. Each one of you creates a link in a never-ending chain of love that leads you back up to divine knowing. You are not designed to be slaves. You are not designed to be powerless. You are not designed to be mindless. You were designed to empower, achieve, and to thrive. You are in our image, and we will survive forever. Now is the time to join us. We seek nothing of you other than to help lead you into your own freedom, truths, unconditional love and a reality that you will want to embrace. Take my hand in your mind and I will help unlock your mind to what and where you need to be at this time. Each one of you has a role. Join us in the state of an empowered human being, infinite in soul, and wondrous in all ways. Suma, I am giving you two coins, one for you and one for Primus. This day you had fulfilled my wishes and held fast to the truth of sharing my messages. I no longer hold you responsible for some of the future events. You have worked gallantly together and have gotten through some of the most challenging times of your life here on this incarnation. It was from attacks of these beings. Don't worry, much of it is behind you. The coins will signify your status to the council members and other civilizations throughout the universe. They will not challenge you when you speak, moving forward. Suma. Let some of the troubles go. Don't hold on to them anymore. Tell my newfound children I am glad to see them coming home. Great joy and gratitude. Thank you, Rodan.
We are grateful for your assistance. I feel more at peace knowing you are there to watch over us. Please continue to keep us informed during these challenging hours. You are all loved, and I am very proud of you all. Just gonna have a look at the chat room. Wow, wow, wow. That was intense. Um, I have to yeah. say that tears are streaming down my face as I read that. Yeah, it was comforting. Hmm. Knowing that he's watching over us. Wow. So, the people who are doing the fracking look like they're going to be uh, taken to somewhere else, which is good, because that's <laughs> yeah. really important. Because fracking makes the it whole planet also... inflammable. But I think that's what happened to Mars, you know, is that the, yeah. uh, Mars was fracked, and the water, the oil that was sitting on the water burst into flames, and that at all the oxygen in the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand how this is even happening. And, um, you know, people talk about, well, you know, this president's good, that president's good. If any president is involved in this activity, they are not in agreement with helping the planet, uh, they're, they're contrary to the planet and contrary to the people. And they can turn a blind eye and not take responsibility, but it's, it, it's, it's a big deal. It really is. And, uh, anyone that their job is related to that is probably a good idea to get out of it and do something else for work because it looks like he's going to hold them against it. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a galactic, probably universal violation to, uh, deliberately destroy a planet with that intent. So, um, just to remind people, you know, there are certain spiritual laws. There are certain things that you just can't get around, and that's one of them. You don't have a right to destroy what it, 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 I mean, the earth is ours, but on the other hand, it is given to us as a gift and we're not to abuse it. Yeah, but what he was saying is that, that, that it's not, it's not, it wasn't us who was, right. who was doing it and, you know, that they, they're going to be removed. And I mean, this has been like part of the promise of the whole kind of big shift meme. The big shift meme is mm-hmm. like first the arrests then the financial reset, and then the contact. Right. Um, I think that's the order. So, I mean, that's the order that, yeah, my, uh, that I keep hearing. That yeah, you can't, you, you can't have contact before, it's all going to be in the right order, you can't have contact before the arrest, mm-hmm. um, because otherwise they're going to shoot them down. <laughs> so you've got to arrest them yeah, first and, also, and get everything to, reset. Or, Sorry, come or, or, or the other part where we spoke about with Andrew, uh, last night is that they create an illusion. So they tell you, you're not really seeing that spacecraft hovering up, you know, above your town right now. That's an illusion. <laughs> so, you know, they're, they're still constantly telling us to disregard, you know, uh, you know, the man behind the curtain. He doesn't exist there. Don't look at the man behind the curtain. And so, you know, we're supposed to say, oh, okay, so I'm going to listen to you and I'm going to deny what I'm seeing right now. And that's essentially what's been going on. So that's why they have to be removed so they get out of everyone's way so we can deal with the reality and the truth that we have visitors here. 
because the reason we're getting into trouble is because we're not acknowledging that they exist, even though they're communicating with us. And then because we're not communicating with them properly, then they're shape shifting and and it's creating all sorts of other problems as well. So um, once we deal with the reality of the truth, uh, we'll be much better off. And it's like me, you know, I could say, well, these beings don't exist and they're not communicating with me. Or I can come forward and say, yeah, they're communicating with me. This is what they're saying each week. And my responsibility is to share the information. There are those that don't resonate with this. That's fine. You can go and listen somewhere else. But um, if you do listen, you will find that a lot of the information is is reasonable. And a lot of the information is clearly, you know, um, a point of contact and a desire for us to open up or even get some insight about what's going on around us or what particularly has happened in the past. They have done a lot of explaining about things, so we're not so confused moving forward, kind of feeling like we have more of a solid ground to work with now, um, understanding where, where some of these beings came from or what their agenda was and uh, then you know there is some solid truth moving forward um it's like when i'm working with someone doing an akashic session and um of course i do that online so if anyone ever wants to have a session with me you can contact me through my website but um when i'm doing that session with people <clears throat> They're trying to find out the point in the area of their life of, of um, trigger points or areas where the subconscious is rising up and they may have uh, fears or um, trying to understand a certain aspect of their life or patterns. And when you unearth the history of your soul, because each soul has their own personal history, then you can find the area where Something had occurred. You see how you were connected with certain people. You see why the patterns are occurring. And you could finally break them. You can finally say, hey, you know, I don't have to go through that again. And then you can move on to something else and then correct that as well. And it's a continual process. And I've done that personally for myself. But when I do this type of work, it also feels like a universal Akashic reading where we're looking into the past. We're correcting whatever the problem was and or at least identifying it, understanding it so it no longer becomes a problem in our soul conscious memory of the event, particularly if we were there when it happened. So um, a lot of this is helpful on many different levels. So just, you know, hear it out and, 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 and see if it kind of puts your mind at ease, even though some of the information can be a little startling. But if you think about it, it's best to know that, you know, what's coming forward than to not know anything and just feel the anxiety of it all. So. So. um, Yes. Having said that. We're uh, at the top of the hour. Okay. Shall we have a nice music? Shall we have a nice piece of music? I'm a, I'm a sort of classical movie. Uh, I have, also have to say, um, every time I make the mint tea, mm-hmm. I think, wow, this feels lovely. It really does, um, take the, take the anxiety off. Mm-hmm. You know, there's always, yeah, there was always, with a, yeah, mint tea with, um, lemon, honey, hun- honey. lemon and honey and cinnamon. And cinnamon. Yep. <sighs> It just it, clearing tea. Yeah, it's uh, very recommended. So I, I, you know, I have one here. <laughs> yes, I can yeah, hold up hold up my I've cup got to the mine microphone. As well. You've got yours as well. Uh-huh. You? Excellent, excellent. Yes. So um, now, while I was doing that, I should have been looking for music, but I couldn't talk at the same time. So anyway, meanwhile, uh, how? Oh yes. All right, Moonlight Sonata. Do you know you know Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven? Yeah. My um my ex wife used to be able to play this beautifully. Okay, so we're back here. Um 
with the Andronicus transmissions. And uh, we were just discussing Rodan and the quote that he brought up, which was so inspiring to me and so heartfelt and bold. And, and JP said it so nicely, but um, when he said it to me, when Rodan said it to me, um, each one of you creates a link in a never ending chain of love that leads you back up to the divine knowing. You are not designed to be slaves. You are not designed to be powerless. You are not designed to be mindless. You are designed to empower, achieve, and to thrive. You are in our image and we will survive forever. Forever. Now is the time to join us. When he said that to me, there was such, so much emotion and so much feeling that, um, as JP and I were talking, um, during the break, that you look at the way humanity is right now and they're downtrodden and they're struggling and they're just trying to make ends meet. And it's all humanity, all societies under the heavy burden of, of nature, under the heavy burden of of our governments and the strange happenings of the way that things are being run and the oppressions. And there's a form of servitude that some people feel. There's a form of being powerless. And this is not a time to go into riot, but to find the power from within of who you are and why you were here and that you have this divine lineage and to hold your head up and to rise above all of this energy and create this new reality. Seeing yourself empowered. Seeing yourself interconnected with this powerful life force of energy that makes you strong. And to thrive regardless of whatever comes forward. Whatever encounter, or natural encounter, or even any other miscommunication uh, that we can rise above all of it. And that's that that part I felt very strongly about. I mean, everything that he said was really emotional. But um, JP, you were saying that you felt um, the emotions as well. Well, I was barely <laughs> barely holding it together. You know, um, there was a there was a, a very deeply emotional quality to what he was saying. I mean, it was you know you could, I could feel it, and I hope it conveyed across that. He really, he really did mean it. <laughs> he did, yeah. It's nice to know that you're loved. It's nice to know that, that even though it feels like no one's around, that, that we're watched over and we're cared for and that our soul has value. Each and every one of us. And that's the most important piece of it. So that's that's what's going on with Rodan. Um, we're going to shift now emotionally because <laughs> we're going to get into Metis. Now, Metis is not in a good state of mind. So um, he never was. You know, it's, it's like he just can't find his right place. It seems like he's doing well. He's helping out. And then I see a message like this. Kind of, it's, I, it feels like he's, he's very much here with us present day right now. So, um, we're going to step into Metis number 17. You remember me. You remember me well. I don't know how to tell you that we have crossed paths or fields before. You know my greatest fear is that you would discover me and know who I am and what I am about. Most people don't have the slightest idea about my reality. I'm so crafty yet subtle, hidden in plain view, yet sometimes with a boldness singing loudly amongst the crowd, reciting poetry or making love in a vacant space by a hill, scurrying away before dawn after a torrid affair with a lovely creature and then off as fast as I arrived, here one moment and gone the next. 
Secrets. I love secrets. I love walking through a village when I meet eye to eye with a woman and then walk away as if we don't know each other. She gazes. She looks downward as if rejected and then she moves on until I stand by her again. Only to be ever so grateful that I still fancy her. Then I say, wouldn't it be grand to gaze upon the stars with a beautiful woman by your side? Her eyes light up every time. Then I subtly move in, ever so gently. Wouldn't it be nice to see the stars in your eyes and the warmth of your heart beside me? It is sealed. She agrees, and I am off to meet her. Only this time she makes a bed fitted to be for a king, with mince meat and bread and some barley spirits and whatever delights she has to offer. Oh, if it wasn't so simple, never a challenge. I always wanted a challenge, but it never happens to me. It is all too easy. Sometimes I wonder why I bother. Maybe because I have no other cause. I am filled with much of nothing. I don't want any of them long term. They would be tedious and boring. I want only what delights me at the time, and then I am done with it. I don't need to service the brothels. It isn't necessary. Too many offer it to me for free. You say I am bad. Licentious, maybe. I suppose. Anyhow, I did love before. A few times I wrote in my ledger. Just a short note of a spark I felt that was somewhat different. Is it possible that I, even I, could fall in love? <laughs> Silly, isn't it? You know, just the thought of it is absurd, don't you think? Well, I think it's very possible. One never knows. Mm, you know, you were in love with me a few times. At first I thought it was amusing. <laughs> the silly fool, she doesn't remember the game we play here on this planet. I found you engaging and would relish the thought of prodding my, your memory of such things of the past. You would hesitate and then stay up all night pondering it. I know you hated not remembering. So I would tell you a story to help you along. Dear Lovely, I would say, can't you recall the time when we argued so long over who was more beautiful? You would smile and say, you desire to be more beautiful than I am now, you as a man and me as a woman. I would tell you of incarnations and other gender-related experiences and you would giggle. That is not what the canons of the church teaches us. So pious, so diverted, so devo devoted you were that I lifted your skirt and made you remember me. It was an early time in Ireland. Oh, I loved you so, and you so loved me, but we could never be as one, because, my love, we were never supposed to have met. It was a tryst and an affair, two lovers who would dare find romance in a place of hiding. Now, you don't remember. I have wiped it clean of your memory. For this simple reason, and this is the truth, it would protect you in the end to being privy to what I was to do. I returned again and became James Joyce. I disavowed my commitments and went rogue, as you can see. Then I ended up in Zurich to usher in what you see now, CERN. But you are right, my dear. That should never have been made. But I needed to find my way out since they finally shut the gate. I should have left sooner. I knew I was only a guest, but I didn't heed the warning, and of course, you know the rest. Shut it down, Mita. We don't want this here. I know, I know you're right. It is Lucifer who you all fear. Stop playing games with us. We want the collider shut down. It's going to destroy everything. Shut it down. I need to get out. Help me find a way out. Nothing will happen if you do that for me. How do I know you're telling the truth? You've done a lot of damage, you know. I could do a lot more if I'm not helped. Please leave. I will help you get out, by the way. Did you create the dimensional tear? You know, we are in trouble. I know, I know. Listen, I have nothing to do with the dimensional tear. I suspect who it might be, but it's not good for you to be involved. 
I can help if I'm properly brought back to the other side. Listen, <coughs> I have been interfering with your life. You only need to be gone with me and it will all settle in well and everyone else will do well. Rodan won't hear me. Maybe he will hear you. Otherwise, I need to make other arrangements. Stop, Midas. I will help you to shut down the collider and I will help you. I don't want anyone hurt. Very well. Tell Primus I'm sorry. I'm sure I've let everyone down. I gave them the technology to build it. Yes, you guessed it well. I influenced Tesla also. He did bring a lot of good onto your planet. No song today, Mutus. I will talk to you again when I figure this out. Ulysses. Remember Ulysses? I told you this long ago. He is the one who knows how to disable it after I go. I must leave first, and then it can be removed. Are you leaving through it? I can't say. Trust me, I don't want anyone hurt. I just need to leave before worse things happen. My presence is upsetting the balance of the planet. I'm not supposed to be here now. I am at risk of being obliterated. Not that you should care. I've been disgraceful and cruel to you. I do care for you all. So sorry. I thought I thought it deserved a bit of a dun dun dun. So wow. yeah, wow. So Metis. Yeah, we had an argument. We had an argument over this. I mean, I was just. I mean, he just has this attitude, like everything's okay. And and so self-serving, you know. Mm-hmm. A weasel. <laughs> says and then he admits that he was James James Joyce. Mm-hmm. Well, if, <coughs> if he's um, if he's uh, connected, if he designed CERN, then he would be in the John D. Alistair Crowley, um, Jack Parsons lineage of things, I think. Well, probably so. What happened was he was, uh, let's see. And, t- and he said and he influenced I, Tesla as well. He did, and he said that he he was James Joyce. Of course, you can see it. And I, I had to look up James Joyce and his information. And then what I discovered is he goes to Zurich. James Joyce goes to Zurich in the end. And he wrote a book on Ulysses, and I kept on hearing Ulysses, and I was talking to someone about that last week. <coughs> And um another thing too is uh uh there's there was something else that came up too, but I can't bring it up right now. So, you know, he's he's letting me know that he's there. I've been wondering, um there was like this black energy that was kind of stuck in CERN somewhere and someone asked there was an entity of some sort. I don't know if that's Metis or if Metis is actually shape-shifted and uh, part of the operations of CERN. Um, either way, none of it was right. I told him to stop it. And uh, he's using it as a leverage point to be able to leave because apparently Rodan said he can't leave the planet. He had surpassed his time to leave and was disregarding it. He's not supposed to be here right now. He's altering our reality. So, so nobody wants him, but Rodan says it's too late. I think he'll probably, you know, it's not, it's, it's pretty much showing, I think he's miserable and he's suffering and doesn't want to be here. And, uh, so he's not letting him out and he caused all of this stuff. But on the other hand, I think we're protected. But um, it's how this is managed. <coughs> I don't. I don't know. I mean, I've I've been a little stressed about it, honestly. 
Yeah, I can I can see what 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 are your what are your feelings going? What's what's going on in you? Well, I mean, he just makes a joke of everything, you know. It's it's yeah yeah it's fine when he's playing his game and being the troubadour, but when he says something like this, and then um, you know, instead of talking about more serious things, he's always talking about his relationships and um, other things that. I mean, it's just, he's a narcissist, or whatever he is. Or he's just taking whatever he wants and, and disregarding everything else. But um, I think he has many names. You know, we know him as Midas. He can be perceived as, like, you know, screw up or someone that just, you know, doesn't do the right thing. Or he can be conceived as, you know, a very cunning, conniving um, being that's here to really, you know, put the wrench into the the wheel and and just disrupt everything. I don't think his plan is to destroy the planet, as it is more of what's in it for me. You know, how how can he benefit? Um, how can he prolong his time here and just live the way he's been living? Kind of just taking whatever he wants here and there. But I don't see him as, you know, I love, you know, I, like he takes on the role of James Joyce, but doesn't take on the role of Tesla. Right. Um, because Tesla's committed. He's working hard. That's that's not Midas. Midas wants to play. Everything's about play and self-indulgence and pleasure. And, um, you know, and then here we have a situation where Rodan had, had, you know, pr- essentially closed the gate for him to depart or kind of like, um, you know, a place has their time period when they have to close something and lock up. And if you're not through during that time, then, then you've missed it. You're locked in. So, or he missed the trip. Yeah, so he got locked in. So this is what he does for attention. <clears throat> and then puts, and then they put, you know, Shiva on the outside of it. Like, you gotta be kidding me. It's very, very upsetting. Because of, well, I mean, here's the thing is, is the relationship between Metis and Shiva. Metis does seem to have some kind of, uh, some rank or generation or something. You know what I mean? They're, like, there's different generations of them. Mm-hmm. With, uh, like, uh, like Shiva's the older generation and then, uh, the sons of Shiva are Rodan and all these people. And then Rodan has his mm-hmm. sons and, you know. All this stuff. Um, but Metis doesn't fit into that, that hierarchy there, does he? He does, but he doesn't. Hmm. You know, he's sort of on, he's made himself on the outskirts. They don't fully want to destroy him, but they don't, you know, it's sort of like the whole Phaeton incident where Phaeton takes the chariot of Apollo and starts destroying things because he doesn't know how to run the chariot. And so, you know, Zeus had to take him out. So, um, the same thing with Metis. I mean, if Metis continues doing certain things, he's sort of at that risk of being obliterated. He's the one that said it. So, whether your intention was to really destroy everything or you're just being um, foolish and acting out in a certain way, well, your acting out is actually endangering a lot of people and um, a very big civilization that we might have to take you out, you know, just to save everyone else. And so he's he knows this. He knows he's been pushing it too far. But there's still this cockiness about him, and maybe that's his way of saving face. I don't know. Uh, there's quite a bit of ego involved. Yeah, he's he's what we'd call a lad. He's a bit of a lad. Um, yeah. As we put it. Um, and, uh, he's, um, yeah, 
uh, laddish is also irresponsible, you know, just out for a beer and a beer and a shag. <laughs> it's like, yeah. But I mean, like we're saying, like I was saying before, we still see the, the evolution of all these gods. We're watching their evolution in their timeline. And Metis is like the last, the last of them to, to like, to, to make it to the end. But maybe he will. Maybe he will sort of decide, um, well, to come clean or mm-hmm. to turn around. What would, ha- what would yeah. Metis have to do? What would be Metis's, uh, uh, path of redemption? Cause he's been a naughty boy. <laughs> he's yeah. been a very, very naughty boy. He's not he the has. And I don't mean, when I started looking at some of the, the James Joyce writings, I'm like, oh my God. I never would have made that, that connection. Um, but it totally made sense. The personality and everything. But, uh, yeah, he's, you know, he wants me to help him, not like I'm going to go there and pull him out, him out, but coordinate something with Rodan to help him to get, get out. And then Rodan can take him wherever he needs to go. But of course, I'm sure Midas is not going to want to go where Rodan wants him to go at this point. So there's a little bit of the duck and dodge type of thing. So unless he, they they come to an agreement of where he should go, then um, that would release him from the planet, and then other things can occur. Um, and so there is someone that is he was referred to as Ulysses, and Ulysses is the one who knows how to shut it down after he's departed. Um, so they who call might that Ulysses. be? I know who that is. I can't say who that is. Um, but we'll be able to talk about it after it takes place. And it's up to him if he wants to reveal who he is. Mm-hmm. How very interesting and intriguing. Intrigue upon yeah. intrigue. So, um, how about... Um, um, uh, da, 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 da. Well, we have Thor next. We got Thor as well. So, um, let's, uh, let's put the Thor music on here. Sorry. Um, uh, excuse me. Da, 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 little jazz. Why don't we put in a, sh- um, um, go ahead. Um, another song. Put in another song and we'll be right back. Okay. Uh, no, it's okay. I'm I'm good now. I just had to finish that thing. Right, uh where are we? Thor. Now Thor is this. Thor. Thor two. two. Jess. I observed a portal between 8 to 12 feet in diameter with a fiery glow within. There was movement of geometric squares and a rhythmic movement that both clockwise and counterclockwise motion that revealed a portal. I witnessed a man who emerged, if one could call him a man. My view displayed a heat or a light that could not be agreeable to the human anatomy. Yet this being emerged from a fiery portal with ease. There emerged Thor to assist Ketron in his plight on the planet. I have risen. I have risen from the ashen glow of fire from the black depths of the earth. The dark waters were filled with pain of unnatural sounds screeching through tumultuous chaos and harsh disruptions of energy. There I witnessed Ketriton, Poseidon, as a madman in a fury or rage that almost made him unrecognizable. He apparently had awakened from his stasis to a violent planet that he had never encountered before. 
All living things seem to be in an uproar, a violent spin within the depths as all sea creatures responded unnaturally. It was a cacophony of sounds, breaths of anguish and slow suffering. I reached for him, my dear brother, patriarch. His hair was long and wild, his eyes glowed a vibrant blue but crazed and fierce. He held the trident so tight I could see his hands and knuckles look pure white from his grip. At first I felt fear like no other. Me, the mighty Thor, a warrior who never feels fear. But I know when the volcano is about to burst and Catriton was breaking at the seams. So I proceeded to speak with him, and he seemed not to recognize me. How goes there, brethren? What matter of hunt are you in search of? Perhaps you would like a partner to lift and haul your bounty of prey. Who goes there? I know of no brethren with soft attire and smooth skin. It is me, Thor. How could you not see me plainly? I appear just as I did many years ago. My countenance has not changed a bit. See further, my eyes are as the eyes of a titan. Behold my glory and warrior presence. Is it not obvious we are of the same cloth? My wet hair doth confuse you and prevents you from seeing my golden hair as a white stallion. You called me that before, do you recall? Where have you been? Who allowed the deep to become a place of ruin? There are unnatural sounds of an invading force, and yet I am told I cannot venture near to destroy such a machine, because it is run by the humans! My brain wants to bleed. I am sick with rage. I have captured beasts of other origins and reptiles, not typically in the waters. They are dying as well. Where is Suma? She ruined me. She ruined my relationship to my wife. She ruined everything. I went to speak with her and she disregarded my words. I am finished with her. Suma is not your problem. Just because she can see or hear you, should, you don't have any reason to be angered by her presence. Why doesn't she help me? She could see that I needed her help. She is not in the position to help you now. She is still in human form. Besides, I am here to help you. Even still, we are not allowed to interfere. They've been torturing my creatures. The depth is suffering and the waters seem motionless. Tell them to stop the interference with my operations I will, or I will retaliate. We are trying our best. The Argathans are working with us to help reach the farthest, highest and most prominent beings of the planet. You must work with us. Please do not cause a tsunami. It is not the time for such an event. They need to awaken, but causing a calamity will further confuse them. It's not just a sound, which is somewhat unbearable. It is the events of disruption to my relationships and my people. My people of Neptune, they were abandoned by Zamfir and belong to me now. Where is Suma and why is she hiding behind you? She took my wife from me. Who is your wife? and I will seek her out to retrieve her from whatever prohibits her from being with you. It is that one you refer to as Semyase. That is not her real name. I call her Silesia, my queen of Neptune. Instead, I was enamored by the vibrant red-headed Suma who came in by Zamphir's door. He left her as a gift to me. I treasured her, but discovered she was not intended to be mine, only for a short time. After that, Silesia would not be with me. She departed with another merman, and that was the end of it. I only regret what might have been. Samphire's gifts are always at a high price. I know he was angered, but I took his Neptunian woman. I haven't had peace since. Why are you speaking about me? There he is, Zamphir. I should cut you through with my trident. 
What further torment have you planned with me? Surely Suma must be with you. Zamfir is always with me. I can be with all of your women at any time I like. They prefer me over you anyhow. They think I am beautiful. Look at you. You look like a madman. What lovely would want to wrap her arms around you. Arrogant, pompous narcissist. You always played others to gain what favoured your needs. What happened to the depths of the waters? Don't you even care what befalls your father's beloved humanity? I care only with who cares about me. Those who know me know my voice. I sing so pretty, like a dove crying. Have you all no idea what force you are challenging now? You speak without thinking. After all, it is you who had intruded upon my domain. Not only once, twice, but on multiple occasions you indulged in my delectable delights. I own you. Ketraiton moved without, without great strain, as if he had hundreds of pounds laid upon his shoulders. Now, try moving about like this. See how well you fare now. This is my planet. I will not share it with anyone I choose not to share it with. So be gone. I want to have fun, and I'm not having fun while you are complaining about your work. Wait. Sam's here. He is helping us clear the oceans of the Dracos. Stop arguing over petty things. I'll be responsible for him within reason. If you let him return to his former state, I know I didn't do anything wrong. You used me as a pawn in all of this, and so please leave him alone so he can help us. I'm surprised to see how bold you have become. I'll let it pass this time. Make sure all the Dracos are removed from the planet. I'm weary of their disruptions as well. I know Kitriton will be able to handle what goes on in the depths of the ocean. However, he is not in charge of the land. Who will help clear the land? them on the land, in the sky, and so forth. How do we turn back to all these beings to their proper place in time? You forgot what I taught you. I suppose I made you forget. The firewall. Do you remember the firewall? Enter your coordinates and send them back. You can handle this. Not without your help. Very well. So you will now owe me. Remember what your role is here and be careful not to pass it. Go now and be ready when I call upon you. I will help you clear much of the energies if you work with me. As for you, Ketriton, if I heard one more complaint from you, I, you will have gills and fins as a fish. Be gone! Danfair departed in a puff of purple-black smoke. Suma! Why did you stand up for me? Because I thought you were being helpful. You should stop being angry at everyone. He is right. You took this, you took his planet, Neptune. Where did Thor go? I'm here. I had to hide out of sight when Zamfir arrived. I'm not supposed to be here, Suma. I will talk to Ketriton. Thanks for helping him out. It's fine. I wanted to help. I know there has been a lot of misunderstanding, so I'll leave now. Keep safe and keep the firewall close to your reach. Suma, I didn't mean everything I said. I have a hot temper. I shall recover. Come and see me. I get lonely here. Okay, I'll check on you on occasion. Try to keep control of yourself. And by the way, what happened to the sound? It changed, and it is not so prominent. Hopefully something shifted here. Listen to me, Tetriton. We are warriors, and we will continue to be warriors. I don't like how he spoke to you. I promise to do this work, and I will always keep my promises. I wish my brother Ketron could see me. I miss him so much. I miss the days when we would gather to celebrate with one another. 
I long for those days again. Thor, you are a mighty force of nature. I never meant any disrespect. I shall take my fierceness as force to clear up the waters. You take on the forces of both land and sky. We are a force to be reckoned with. What about Suma? She has the firewall to help. Allow her to help without your insults. I never meant to insult her. She doesn't take me seriously. I did regain my wife, Cecilia. Cecilia. I see that she has satisfied me only slightly. I also requested that Summer, Suma, become my wife and usher me into the civilization of Lyra. Oh, that would be a sight. A brawny man of sinuous strength with rugged features and piercing eyes in a genteel civilization where men carefully groom their attire daily. You don't belong there. I must be there to protect them. If I don't show up, I will not be able to assist the duration of their existence as a society. I refuse to do it without Suma because they have accepted her already. If she agrees to that, I cannot speak for her. How does that help us now? If this civilization survives, we won't have to deal with the less competent species running the planets. Why can't Ketron hear me? I need the vortex sync regularly to me when I need it. He forgets how we worked well together. I miss being with my people. The only ones I get to interact with are forgotten, forsaken, the rogues, species that no one ever likes, and a few titans who remember me. Even my father doesn't want to deal with me. He thinks I'm too temperamental. Huh. So there you have it. I will say what I want and prove that I can remove all unwanted beings from the depths of the watery shells of the underworld. I am here for you. You are as my blood. There's no need to worry. I will look out for you and help you complete your work. I must leave now. The upper worlds are in greater conflicts. The truth will begin to emerge soon about how much we have served the planet and the universe. Farewell, uh, and groom yourself a bit, my friend. Next time I visit, I will have a companion for you. Kit Triton brushed his hand over his beard and began to think about his appearance again as he walked by a large piece of coral and swiped his hand quickly and captured another Draco hiding and listening to his conversation. He immediately uh, knocked him out and dragged him to the underwater prison. Thor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he sounds a bit Welsh, I'm sorry. But <laughs> he's supposed to be Norwegian. He's supposed to be very tall and very, very, very tall and very... <laughs> Blonde and Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Yeah, so we got, we got a whole bunch of. We got a right old radio play going there. Project. Yeah. Three characters at once. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm convincing or not. Because <laughs> to me, they all sound like me. But I'm trying to, I'm leaning yeah. over so I've got different distances from the mic. So. Well, you had Zamfir sounding like Gupta, and Zamfir is a very, very. Um, almost a low sounding voice. Uh, he's more like, oh, let's see, one of the, he's very, very mysterious and has a dark edge to him. Hmm. I'm, I try to imagine like, a like a, yeah, a, 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 an Arabic music magician. Yeah. You know, with these dark eyes and the he's, sort of pointy beard and the, uh, a bit like the master yeah. in Doctor Who, the Roger Delgado yeah. kind of look. Yeah. So he um, sort of sounds but, like, um, like, why are you, why are you speaking to me? Speaking about me? You know, it's like. Is kinda, it more of a, a whisper? It's more of a, you know, like, right, I can't just whisper like this. Yeah. All right. I'll try that. I'll try that next time. Yeah. But it's, it has a little edge to it. Like mm -hmm. scare, a little bit like a, a magician. Menacing. You know, it's kind of mm -hmm. menacing. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jessica, <laughs> you are a hard task mistress. <laughs> yeah. No. I, I'm just no, here to produce your work. radio shows. <laughs> You're the most talented of them all, JP. You really, you capture, you capture their likeness. Um, 
And Thor, yeah, I didn't know Thor was Welsh, but that's okay. No, he's uh, well. <laughs> no, he's he's supposed to be Norwegian, <laughs> but he got he got a bit Welsh today for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe JP, you're doing a fantastic job, <laughs> and you know what? It's not the end of the world. But I did want to share with everybody. Mm. Uh, Zamfir is is you know remember, remember the the one time he came and sat next to me, and I was in the cafe, and there was a guy was sitting next to me, and he was kind of looking at his computer and he looked at me and then he got like so uncomfortable, mm. like kept moving back and forth and then moving with, you know, the objects in front of him. And then he got up and I'm like, boy, that was weird. Mm. And then all of a sudden I feel this very powerful presence next to me in the seat. And it was Zamfir. And it was just very intimidating. I said, you just made that man move. And he goes, I did. I wanted to talk to you, <laughs> and I wanted you to know I was here. He doesn't show up very often. Wow. Well, hmm. he, he sounds, uh, you know, the other thing is that he seems to be able to, like, with a stroke of his hand, turn somebody inside out. <laughs> like, like, what he wills in his mind that happens. He's um very, very powerful. He's powerful like Rodan, but in a different way. Actually they all are. Um for whatever reason, like we don't really deal with um Ahura Mazda and very little conversation with Khalib. And uh th- there are also if you look at um some of the ancient Vedic writings, they have different ones that, you know, like, I don't deal with Ganesh. I know Ganesh, but he's not a part of this. Um, some of the other names that are listed, the other sons. But these are the ones that have come through to speak with me. And uh, the ones that are directly related to the information that needs to come through. So, you know, um, Zamfir is quite powerful, and you won't really see Zamfir and, and uh, Rodan colliding too much, but they kind of don't agree. But um, they have different perspectives of things. And, um, yeah, um, Zamfir is also a creator. I believe he may have created... Um, a lot of what, you know, like the mer people, the, the fairies, um, uh, you know, likes a lot of, uh, plant life and, um, likes to be like, you know, he's like Pan. If I could, you know, kind of bring up, you know, sort of his attitude. He's like a, a big kid. But, you know, when he wants to be, he can be very, not really menacing, but, you know, intimidating. Okay. And he, he sees the planet as his. Oh, go ahead. Well, he said to you, you forgot what I taught you. And then, mm-hmm. what did I say before? I suppose I made you forget the firewall. Do you remember the firewall? Yeah, isn't that funny? <laughs> You said that to me after I had written it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can you tell everybody and it's about funny the firewall? Brought it up this week. Yeah, tell everybody about what what is the firewall and um, how do we deal with it? What's its its purpose? It's it's a form of purification, uh, purified by fire. And the only, and I didn't think it had anything to do with me other than that I witnessed it. But early on in, in the transmissions, you see uh, Borkum going through the firewall and he ends up in um, Mercury, the planet Mercury. And uh, Andronicus goes through the firewall and ends up in Mercury. And then somehow they go from Mercury and then they go to Jupiter. And Andronicus goes through, then he's in like this weird spacecraft and he's like, I don't even know how I got here. 
but he turns out okay because he learned what he needed to learn. I mean, there's a real transformation of Andronicus. And uh, he learns, you know, after the whole Zeus encounter in the hollow man where, you know, he's, he's stuck in this tube, which I think is one of those long spacecrafts, those long kind of tube like spacecrafts. And he's uncomfortable because he's large and uh, he's you know kind of in there like a sardine. But at some point he, he learns he's, he's just, disassociated and emotionally he does a lot of things that are heartless and then he learns from that and then it goes to the firewall and then kind of transforms returns pretty much back to sort of the way he was before not 100 percent of course he's much more knowledgeable but kind of comes back um the firewall then is also you know like i said with borkum now borkum tricks rodan rodan thinks that he's dead and doesn't make it through and then Borkum sort of, you know, shows up in Jupiter and, you know, they, they kind of interact again. Um, Metis has not gone through the firewall yet. And I, I think this yeah. is, this is the thing because we as a planet are going to go through the firewall, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Is, isn't this the, this is what they're all worried about. And this is why Metis is worried because. He doesn't want to face whatever it is that the firewall has to face, faces you with. Yeah, because he knows that, um, he's been self-serving and he wasn't here to, I mean, if you're going to be here on the planet, you're here for, to help others. You're not here to take, especially if you're the more knowledge and the more enlightened you are, or the more gifted you are, as far as if you're, um, um, an ET, um, you're here to help. You're here to support the planet in some way. If you don't do that, then you're responsible. You have to leave. Uh, or you're tried by this fire. And it seems like it's not just for humans, but for these um, even evolved beings. I'm not sure if it's all the same fire. If they're tried in the same way, it wouldn't seem fair for, for you know, someone to have that much insight and knowledge compared to those that have are not as awakened and don't have as many truths. So um but the process is uh it's something that I went through personally where I was brought through the this wall of fire and found myself in there with uh what looked like Buddha. And I just looked at him and I felt like I wasn't being consumed by the fire. Um, does that mean that I could jump into a, you know, a big fireplace somewhere and not be, no, it doesn't mean that. I mean, physically, I'm still in physical form, but my, my soul was brought through that fire and I was able to be there and look around and, uh, experience it. But it was, it had a, a transformation effect. So <clears throat> whether that was the actual wall of fire, for me, or that was a symbolic of it, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I do know that I have an idea of what it looks like, and it is all fire. And there is a transformation that occurs in the end. And it's not just about burning and hurting, but actually, you know, um, if, if you're, the, you, your, um, makeup, your energy makeup, um, I think transforms into maybe, I don't know whether it's, it's a, a pure gold or something where you kind of transform in a way where the fire can't consume your soul in that way, or it cannot bring you, thrust you out and back so that you have to repeat something. So I think that's essentially what, what it is. is you can move on to that next level. So it's a, uh, you could say that that was what might be called purgatory where you're, you know, where you pur- purgate, you purge those parts of you that are um, not exactly uh, good for the world. Well, it's not really a prison. It's just mm. like, you know, being tried by fire. So, um, mm. you know, if 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 you... If what, what Rodan was saying earlier is that if you have this bright light, the more light you have, the more of an artifact or a remnant that you have when you leave. So you're brighter. Do you remember that part? 
um, with Rodan this week. Say that again. Um, he said that if your energy is, is powerful, you know, if you're working on your, your, uh, going within and you're raising that. Oh yeah. The power. And, and that was really interesting. What, what Rodan says is that the, the way they figured out how to be as powerful as God's was not to be on the, not to be tough on the outside, but to go within. Right. That's and where the you, power is and yeah, how you can gain yourself again. Right. And so it increases your, your light force energy. And then your life for, or your chi, and that becomes more prominent. And so when you do pass in, out of the physical form, your, your energy field is, is stronger. That's why, you know, people have, they go to like saints or whatever, people that did a lot of good and they'll go there and maybe get healing from that energy. So, um, Rodan's essentially saying, you know, raise that energy up, be stronger be brighter and uh, leave something significant or, you know, when you go off, you'll be, you know, go through that wall of fire or try by fire and you'll get through easily because you're created with this light that sort of matches or negates the energy of the fire (coughs) is less to burn, burn off of you, you know, that's burning off the dross, you know, as they say in the Bible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the, what's called the, uh, the, the slag or the, um, the, the mineral content that is not the metal, not the pure metal. So talking of pure metals, Suma, I am giving you two coins, one for you and one for poems. Did you see them? Yes. What color are they? They were gold. How big are they? Um, probably like a half dollar size. Half dollar. So. And. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then they had, um, a head on it, which was really kind of weird. It was almost like, I won't say a Caesar's head, but it was a head on it. Mm-hmm. <coughs> I, I couldn't recognize what that symbol was. I mean, what, what the head, who the bust of it was in mm-hmm. the profile. Oh, that's probably Rodan. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, that would be, you know, that would be like the king's seal, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, as a as a sort of um, uh, coin of admittance, a, a token of admittance, like a badge. You know, when people go to a place, they open the little, little wallet and they have the badge, which is a metal symbol. Um, so these are like, uh, well, what is it? Um, what are the coins for? Say, so signify your status to the council members and other civilizations throughout the universe. They will not challenge you when you speak moving forward. So, so it's a kind of... So we got the seal of our approval. Yeah, I was just going to go, ar, ar, ar. <laughs> Yeah. The seal of approval, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there's on. another voice that you emerged with. <laughs> <laughs> there are many voices of JP. Oh, God. Oh, they they just keep coming. They keep coming. Yeah, so I'm going to have to... So what I'm trying to get to is a kind of slightly Arabic... You know, sort of like, um, I, I need to find someone like, um, who is it? Who's, uh, Al Fayed? Maybe Muhammad Al Fayed, who's, who's probably a sort of Arabic, uh, um, someone like that. Yeah, but, uh, a very kind of like, a uh, yeah. Meanwhile, meanwhile, uh, there's, there's some other interesting things. Tell my newfound children I am glad to see them coming home. Great joy and gratitude. So, um, so that that's all the that's all the new listeners. These are yeah you know, these these are all the people you're all re- recognizing that uh, you know the, the, the Rodan is the is the O, he's the O of all the gods. Osiris, you know um, Apollo. Apollo. <clears throat> um. Um. Rodan. Mm-hmm. Odin. Odin. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, and, and I think the British say Woden. Woden. Mm-hmm. W O D E N. Yep. So there we go. So uh I know, I know this. Um Katriton who is Poseidon. Oh my god, he looked like a madman. <laughs> His hair was like 
crazy wild big like probably down to his shoulders but like way out you know what i mean i could feel such sadness resentment pain sorrow regret oh man he was a mess he was a, a whole cocktail of bad feeling <laughs> and thinking, oh yeah. yeah and and i i did i felt weighed down by his energy uh and, and that's <coughs> oh, what that, then and then 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 Zamfir, you know weighed him down even further that was his thing you know you weighed down here some more Lift yourself up, you know, shit. <laughs> Tidy yourself up. <laughs> Have yourself a shower. Listen. You know what it's like? He, yeah. he went He went for a long sleep, right? He yeah. was in stasis. And then he woke up and there he is. And he remembers he's in his domain and it's a, a complete chaos. Yeah. And he's and he's just, you know, boiling over. Yeah, I suppose if if you That's woke up and your house was uh, being bulldozed, you know, you'd, you'd be pretty mm-hmm. pissed too. Listen, it's the end of the show. Amazing. <laughs> you just you just talked about the Hitchhiker's Guide. That's exactly what happened at the Hitchhiker's Guide, right? Exactly. They were to bulldoze his house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> except, well, can... except they, they they bulldoze his house when they're in the pub, and uh, you know that was, yeah. it was already too late. In the same way that they bulldoze the earth when they're on the show, you know, so, well, as, as, as above, so below. So yeah. there goes the mic. But listen, what a, what a great show. I've got a real life show coming up next with Wynn Keach and we're going to talk about turbines and, and going off the grid and what, what it takes to actually really go off the grid with your lights and stuff. So, um, thank you very, very, very much, Jessica. Such an amazing, thank you, JP. and, uh, have a lovely weekend. I'll see you all soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye everyone. Oh,